in my work at Helium, I am very cognizant of like, okay, what grants are we giving to which people? Are we giving grants to people who live in the global north to build infrastructure in, and own that infrastructure in the global south? Yeah. We don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, there, there are all of these sort of sensitivities. But I think, um, I think, I think we kind of just need to be real about a lot of the crypto space and say like, this is not necessarily a revolution as a lot of people think it is because it's not a social revolution, mm -hmm. uh, but it's more an evolution of corporate governance, or, you know, right. which, um, which is really just a slight change. We live in a time where design and technology touch every aspect of our lives, but where did it all come from? Who designed it? How was it built and brought to market? What will it look like in a year, two years, a hundred years? From the phones and smartwatches that help us in our day to day to the cutting edge spaceships and 3D printers that are leading us into the future, modern design is constantly shaping the way we work, communicate, problem solve, and play. And every new design, big or small, starts with an idea and a bill of materials. I'm Magenta Strongheart and this is The Bomb, where we talk to leading innovators in the tech world and celebrate the transformational power of design. Today on the podcast, we're joined by Clarissa Redwine. When I first met Clarissa back in 2017, she was the West Coast Design and Tech Outreach Lead for Kickstarter. She's been an NYU Law Fellow focused on open source hardware and is now the Grants Program Manager at Helium, a wireless network that's working to build a decentralized telecom. We'll talk about how Tweet got her into the tech world, what she's doing now to jumpstart innovative concepts using IoT, and how crowdfunding for design and tech is changing. Thanks so much for joining us today, Clarissa. Really excited to have you on our podcast, The Bomb. And we are here in beautiful Barcelona. We're very lucky to be here working together on a collaborative event between your, um, your current company, yeah. <laughs> which we're yeah. gonna get into how you got there, but Helium Foundation and Hackaday Prize. We're so appreciative for Helium's support for Challenge 4, which is just about to launch Climate Resilient Communities. And we were here doing a air quality sensor for Urban River Environments Workshop, which we just had yeah. the other night. Yeah, and I think it exciting. went really awesome. Yeah. I was so proud of how that came together. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it was amazing when almost all the way through, there was music outside. Yeah, <laughs> it felt like a celebration of the workshop. Yeah, it was yeah. like, we made it. Cause it was a pretty intense, it was like a four hour workshop. Yeah, About yeah. halfway through, I was like trying to gauge everyone and people were so still like focused yeah. and excited about what they were building, which I think just is one of my favorite parts about the kind of open source hardware community that we get to be a part of is that yeah. people are so stoked to just nerd out about new hardware, learning new skills, yeah. learning how to solder. We had an awesome mix of, you know, people, they're totally their first time picking up a soldering iron yeah. and then folks that had developed um, hardware, you know, projects before. Someone was showing me their their build at the end of the workshop that they were really excited about. Um, and I was like, you got to put that on Hackaday. <laughs> um, they're like, we've been reading Hackaday forever, but I haven't posted any projects. I'm like, Why? oh my God, now's the time. Yeah. So yeah, so it's great to um, to connect with people in person again. Yeah. Uh, I really missed that. And, and to get to collaborate in person on events again. Yeah. And yeah. I was trying to remember when the first time uh, we met was, I thought it was at the Art Center um, uh, event we did at Design Lab. I'm pretty sure that I remember like you in an amazing outfit and that's why you stood out, you know? <laughs> Love that. Yeah, yeah, but... That's what I'm for. The looks. <laughs> yeah, I got to bring the jumpsuits back. I feel like that helped me like, uh, it was like part of the brand people <laughs> recognize me for and I stopped wearing them all the time. And I think it's like, who's that without the jumpsuit? <laughs> <laughs> You know, you were talking about embroidery. You can now do the bomb. True, on your the bomb jumpsuits. Yeah. A new, <laughs> a new round of the, a new iteration of the look. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it's been incredible that we've just been able to continue to work together since then. And I would love to just learn more um, about how you kind of got to now being the grants program manager at Helium. So take us all the way back and tell us about that journey. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I know you're you're interested in people who like didn't start in tech, but somehow found their way into tech, and that's definitely me. Um, so when I went to school, I actually took so many different classes, a lot of them in humanities. So I have concentrations in linguistics and philosophy and social science. That's sort of what my 
degree, it's an integrative studies degree is for. But yeah, I, I took um, some really great classes by a linguist that studied under Noam Chomsky, wow. you know, everything between like, you know, poetry to microbiology, just like the, any class that looked interesting mm -hmm. I would take. And, um, and through that time, I sort of started taking more and more classes that were related to entrepreneurship or like building things. And I was like, oh, this, this seems cool. But the school that I was at didn't really have the classes that I wanted on how to build a startup or how to actually make something and put it out in the world. And um, <laughs> funny enough, I actually tweeted our city councilman and said, hey, let's start a like tech meetup group. And he was like, okay, sure, <laughs> at my house. And That's so, so awesome. Yeah, so like when we showed up, it was me, this like 20 year old in this room full of like 30 and 40 year old men. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that was like who showed up yeah. in this like city councilman's network. And it, it was actually, even though it was a little bit of an odd meeting, it was a really exciting event because there was real momentum and people felt like, yes, we need this meetup. There are people in this town that like want to build projects together, want to learn from each other. And there's enough tech skill sets and experience that we can actually build something interesting. And out of that came, a bunch of meetups, a bunch of like hack nights. And that was whenever I got really into that like maker culture. Mm -hmm. And then we were like, okay, we have all of this momentum. We're meeting regularly. We need our own space because right now we're out of coffee shops yeah. and in, at people's that point, houses. In people's <laughs> houses. Yes. And we were like filling up the small coffee shops in town. It was just yeah. like, and it wasn't that many. It was like maybe 20 people, but for our little town, that was like a big deal. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so a couple of us got together and we're like, okay, let's, make a co-working space or like a, a maker space together where we can have 3D printers and, you know, m machines that we can build things together on. And that's, yeah, that's one of the first ways that I got into like the maker space culture as well. That's so neat because you entered it, but also like founded something at the same time, <laughs> which is sort of crazy. But also I feel like if you see uh, something missing in your, in your community or something that you yeah. want and you're not seeing other people doing it, you're just like, okay, I'm going to find a way to make this happen. Yeah. The important note too is that oftentimes it's successful through community and through collaboration yeah. with others and finding like this common ground with others that we're also feeling like this was missing yeah. in their area. But one thing that I'm really excited about is when spaces or efforts can continue on without the founding members. Mm -hmm. So um, eventually the city actually took over the space as like um, as like a communal space and ended up funding it so that it would stay um, up and running for the rest of the community, even though most of the co-founders are not there anymore. That's so, so cool. And yeah. it's still running today. Yeah, yeah, it's still That's running amazing. today. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool to be able to look back and be like, I started that and it's still happening. <laughs> well, I was, I was, I mean, this will probably be a common theme in our discussion, but I was like a small part in putting this together. You know, I was sort of a person who was excited, enthusiastic, had the energy and the time, which mm -hmm. is important. And I was helping people who knew a lot more about like renting spaces mm -hmm. and, you know, buying equipment than I did. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important to come to efforts like this and know that you don't have to be the core player. Right. Like you it can do it together. <laughs> it takes a village. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so when I met you, you were the um, design and tech outreach lead for Kickstarter. Right. right? On the West Coast. Yes. On the West Coast <laughs> yeah. specifically, um, which we are so lucky to have you on the West Coast. <laughs> I feel like everyone who's you know, involved in tech and Kickstarter was like, Clarissa makes dreams come true. Oh so I know God. that that's like, you know, um, I'm not alone in that in that feeling. Um, so what was if you could help us, you know, connect from um, helping start this space in Texas to then that role on the West Coast? Yeah. What was sort of the in between there? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. So um, like almost right after we started at the co-working space, maybe a couple months after uh, we had this big event that was like, um, the Denton Doer event or something mm -hmm. like that it was Denton, Texas. And, um, and like literally the next day or within that week, I was flying on to be an intern basically in London for a FinTech accelerator. So okay. I was really interested in the, the model of accelerators. I was like, mm -hmm. Oh, this, this is interesting. It's sort of, from my perspective, it was a program to bring founders that were in similar stages together, needed similar resources and similar education and sort of build out content for them that made sense and allowed them to all help each other. Like mm -hmm. that was sort of what I imagined at the time. 
Um, and so I wanted to learn how that worked so that I could bring it back to our small town in Texas and maybe build a program similar, like a, an incubator or accelerator for our co-working space. Mm -hmm. So I was really interested in that and flew to London. And for three months, I was a program associate um, at the Techstars program. It's like okay. Barclays FinTech Accelerator, which okay, is a partnership. So their bread and butter is making partnerships with large leaders in the industry. Mm -hmm. And um, so whenever I flew to London, it was specifically the partnership between Techstars and Barclays, which is a huge bank in London and out the world. And, um, and all of the startups there were FinTech focused. And after that program, I was like all set to go back to Texas to take back what I had learned. I came back to Denton and then I got a call from Techstar saying, hey, we would love for you to be the program manager for the Qualcomm Robotics Accelerator in oh, San wow. Diego. And I was like, oh, gosh, like I, I love our little co-working yeah, space. But that's a huge opportunity. Yeah, I was like, oh, man, that sounds so cool. Robotics just was like this huge space that I was really interested in. So I packed up everything and actually my partner and I both moved to San Diego. Um, and yeah, that was a wild ride as well. Being part of Qualcomm, for people who don't know, Qualcomm makes a bunch of chips, like they're the brains of most of our phones. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, starting that program from scratch at Qualcomm was also interesting because it's a, it's an intellectual property machine. So right. that's really where Qualcomm makes its money is mm -hmm. by creating and generating IP. So an accelerator where people are building new technology with the help of Qualcomm is a very like sticky subject. Yeah. <laughs> and did they did they make it clear that they wanted IP if if these accelerator, you know, if these startups were successful, if it was something that was relevant to their business, they wanted that IP? No. Or they were totally yeah. cool with just supporting. They were cool. So at the time, they had this little project that, you know, had a, a secret name and it was the Snapdragon, okay. which is like one of their biggest products yeah. right now. And, um, and this little thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the reason, one of the big reasons that they were starting up the accelerator was to have startups come in that made sense as, you know, um, users of the Snapdragon. Kind of subjects. <laughs> right. So these are like drones. Um, uh, yeah, like different different types of robots that would really benefit from a board like Snapdra mm -hmm. Snapdragon. And and so they wanted to have these startups come in and see how they use that technology and if it was like viable or, you know, what kinks they needed to work yeah. out. That was really their core interest in the program. But it was funny because most of the time for these Techstars programs, they have a suite of mentors that come in from the partner company. So mm -hmm. like Barclays had a suite of fintech experts right. come in and help the startups but for Qualcomm it was really hard to get those people because they didn't want any type of overlap of um, skill sets or knowledge because they didn't want something to happen where one engineer was actually working on a similar technology just in parallel totally mm -hmm. unrelated come talk to a startup and then there was any like question of whether or not uh, that yeah. idea came out of that mm -hmm. so it was really difficult That's tricky, <laughs> yeah. absolutely to navigate yeah. that yeah so a lot of times we ended up having to pair people from qualcomm that were not the best fit mentor wise because it'd be too close to home yes if it was. Yeah, yeah it was very very interesting situation so um yeah that that program was really interesting i think one of my favorite projects that came out of that there were several good ones. One was like a, a robotic arm that was incredibly cheap. It was like a thousand bucks, which at the time was yeah. very, very cheap. And then another one was Clever Pet, which was also a Kickstarter project. And it was a little like a uh, machine where you put your dog food in and then your dog has to push these buttons that light up and solve a puzzle oh, wow. to get one piece of food. Mm -hmm. I loved it. And my dog has played with it. Nice. <laughs> so. You're like tested and proven. Yes. By, yeah. What's your dog's name? I'm like, I don't know your dog's name. Are we even friends? <laughs> oh my God. Okay. He has a hoity-toity name. Okay. His name is McTeague. McTeague. Wow. <laughs> yeah. There's a oh book. There's a book and a movie actually called McTeague, the story of San Francisco, which is where we oh, got cute. him. Uh -huh. Yeah. He's actually a, a failed dentist the book and I was like a dog would not be a good dentist so yeah that's... you're like appropriate <laughs> yeah McTeague it is yep. oh, I love that. <laughs> awesome so you went from this I'm like thinking you know the fintech is an interesting part of the origin story because sort of a full circle moment now being yeah. at helium right maybe yeah. you could explain helium to us um at this point just so people have a good context of yeah. helium foundation and what you all do so he helium is a wireless network 
it's actually a network of networks. So there are different protocols, like say you have 5G is one type, um, Wi-Fi is another type, LoRa, if anyone's heard of LoRa mm -hmm. or LoRaWAN is another type, which is a specific type of connectivity for very low power, low bandwidth devices, like I anything in IoT, really. Mm -hmm. um, lots of temperature sensors, you know, air quality sensors mm -hmm. that we've been working with in this workshop. Um, and so what, what Helium is, is doing very successfully right now is building a distributed telecom. So if you imagine telecoms, they take years and years, like 10 years to set up new coverage in a network because they're, you know, acquiring the land, they're building these giant towers, they're maintaining the infrastructure with lots of highly specialized equipment and people. Um, so all of that costs a lot of money. Instead, Helium is actually decentralizing that work. So there's a whole ecosystem of people building miniature towers, right. basically. In their homes or businesses. Yes, I mean, yeah. there are makers that can put these together for very little money, like maybe a hundred bucks or so. Um, and then there are also people like Seed or Rack uh, that are actually manufacturing this on a wider scale. Mm -hmm. But the idea is that you take these miniature towers, you set them in your window, on your roof, you can climb up a pole, you know, <laughs> put them on a pole, and you can provide coverage to your community and um, even beyond your community to areas that really need especially this kind of like um, LoRa IoT coverage. So for instance, if you're sort of if you're trying to build a smart solution for an orchard, orchards are very spread out, you know, they're sometimes in the middle of nowhere right. that doesn't really have coverage you can actually just pop up one of these hotspots and cover an incredibly wide area like a mile or more so it, it's um it's a, a network that hasn't existed before and we believe that it really is a, a catalyst for the internet of things that we all imagined five years ago mm -hmm. so yeah that's what helium is doing also maybe we can plug the, the grants program. Right. So your specific <laughs> role there is to manage these grants, which are really to like, um, I was gonna say kickstart, but I'm like, <laughs> to jumpstart um, projects utilizing the Helium network yeah. in an interesting way, right? So basically what I do every day is meet people out in the community that are building IoT solutions that use Helium, like use the network that we're building together and, um, and say, you know what? that looks really scalable. It looks like something that would have an amazing impact and it would showcase the importance of having this decentralized community built network. We're gonna fund it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's really exciting to see someone go from an idea or like an early concept to having the funding they need to actually build out their proof of concept or their MVP. Um, and yeah, we, we've been uh, giving funding out to some pretty amazing projects. I could talk about some yeah, of Yeah, what are yeah. some of your favorites <laughs> yeah. that you guys have given the grant to so far? Yeah, okay, so my favorite one is a little bit out there. <laughs> um, so there, there's this project called Exclosure, and it's in okay. the Bay Area. And this creator is making miniature observatories. So basically a telescope, like a smart connected set of telescopes that images near earth objects and shows sort of like the traffic jam that's happening in space right oh, now. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so like satellites, any like debris, um, it, it is tracking those objects and sort of like creating a, a smart map of them. And it's something that will become increasingly important in the right. future, yeah. And it, it's amazing, honestly, that there's already a business for that. There's already like people wanting to give this creator money in order mm -hmm. to track space junk. Wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah but that, that's a really cool one. And um, and yeah, the creator like got, got a little bit of funding to do that. And it, it's sort of an interesting use case because it is, you know, when you're putting a telescope up, you need it to be kind of in the middle of nowhere where there isn't light pollution. Mm -hmm. So there often isn't coverage as well. And um, yeah, in order to do that work, you really needed some some coverage. So it made sense. That's awesome. And now at Helium, there is a crypto component to what you all do, right? Maybe you can get into yeah. that a little bit. I'm like crypto for dummies now, but <laughs> you know, explain a little bit of how that all relates. And, and also we can get into some of the the Kickstarter projects that you worked on as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, this this idea of a community-owned, decentralized telecom, essentially, wireless network, um, it, it's not necessarily new. 
You know, people have been thinking about this for a long time and seeing a need for a really long time. The problem is that the incentives weren't quite aligned. So, um, you know, you may buy a device, put it in your window, but until the rise and the a sort of acceptance of Web3 or crypto uh, infrastructures, that wasn't really possible. So what's new about Helium and what's really allowed it to have this um, really explosion of growth. So to give you an idea of the growth, it's gone from about 12,000, 15,000 devices in January to now 900,000 devices. Joey was just telling me that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's really incredible. Yeah, it's, uh, it's to see the growth even since I started, it's mm -hmm. like, whoa. Um, yeah. So we'll probably be like at over a million in, in a little bit, maybe a couple weeks or a wow. month. Yeah. Are you guys gonna have a giant party? <laughs> like, I am I invited to the party? I bet we'll just keep working, honestly. <laughs> but but uh, because- also, I'm like, design lab will throw a new party. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you have to remember also that that like, we are not necessarily doing that, you know? Like it, it's the this community of people. Of course. But to answer your question, like, yes. Yeah, so so that that's one of the that's one of the key like innovations that helps this network actually grow. And um, as someone who's very skeptical of crypto, you know, coming into this role, I was like, all right, let's see how this is going to go. Right. It seems to be a model that is doing something interesting. Let's see if it actually brings, you know, value or, um, you know, sensible disruption or like useful disruption to, you know, to the space. Mm -hmm. And um, so far, what I've seen is, you know, it's working, which is. Well, I feel like a lot of the kind of messaging that, um, you know, proponents to crypto want to put out there is about it opening up accessibility, decentralizing, you know, money and financial systems. And that will allow, you know, wealth to kind of be accrued in places that it wasn't before. Yeah. But something about it feels like that's not the way it's going so far. So that makes me kind of, yeah, um, yeah you know, sus of it because it does feel like the people who knew about it first are um, <laughs> cashed out and are gone. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. are um, yeah. you know not who we're thinking about when we're thinking about like under-resourced areas in the world. You know, where it might provide new opportunities. You know, to yeah. them to be able to have um, access to wealth in a way that they weren't before. Yeah, like I think it's only the beginning still, but yeah, I don't know if I buy that it will really open up access to all these. Um, communities. I would agree with that. I think we share a lot of the same yeah. <laughs> perspectives. But um, but yeah, I think in my work at Helium, I am very cognizant of like, okay, what grants are we giving to which people? Are we giving grants to people who live in the global north to build infrastructure in, and own that infrastructure in the global south? Yeah. We don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like it, there, there are all of these sort of sensitivities. But I think, um, I think, I think we kind of just need to be real about a lot of the crypto space and say, like, this is not necessarily a revolution as a lot of people think it is because it's not a social revolution, mm -hmm. uh, but it's more an evolution of corporate governance, sorry, you know? right. <laughs> which um, which is really just a slight change. But um, but for things like Helium, it does seem like you could just look at the the actual progress and the traction that the that this community has built across the globe. And that is like very exciting. Um, but I think we just need to find ways to make it actually accessible and decentralized because as soon as something gets hot or exciting, of course, people with re existing resources are going to hop on board. Right. And, um, so yeah, it's a, it's a tricky area, but but, well, know. it's an exciting time, I think, to be in this space. And I'm glad you're one of the people <laughs> helping, you know, get to manage kind of um, the, the resources there. I will say that. <laughs> um, and so you said it was your first time being in a role like this, as far as you said, managing a grants program. But yeah. I do think there's a lot of similar kind of overlap to what you were doing at Kickstarter. Yeah. You were supporting, um, you know, hardware design and tech. Uh, projects and helping these creators get funding through Kickstarter. So yeah. in a way, it was similar as far as project development, how to tell your story effectively, right? Yeah. right and yeah. and again, try to get um, some money backing your, yeah. uh, you know, the future of your project and trying to develop it further. Yeah, but I'd love to hear some of the yeah. projects that stood out to you. Yeah, I think I think at Kickstarter, other than the crowdfunding model itself, the closest I sort of like came into the orbit of the 
idea of Web3 was really with open source projects. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's a similar vibe. Um, so yeah, so it was really interesting to see projects come in and say, okay, we're building something, we're gonna raise funding for it on Kickstarter, but it's entirely open source. You know, that, that was a really interesting thing. And my entire team at Kickstarter, whenever we saw a project like that, tried to put our weight behind it. Um, but the funny thing is it always, like our support for a project had limitations, you know, it always right. stopped at, you know, putting it in the newsletter. <laughs> and, right. And like now, you can promote it as yeah. much as possible, but yeah. then it was what the it's community, yeah, yeah, if they're going to get actual get backers. Right, sort of right, right. But yeah, so that that my time at Kickstarter really sort of like set me up to, um, you know, build affinity around these ideas of like cooperation and co-ownership and um, yeah, and like funding projects together that we feel need to exist in the world because um, that's one of the big problems with wireless coverage especially you know telecoms choose where to put coverage based on so many factors that don't include where people need right. coverage it's how are they yeah. going to make money i would right. think at yeah. the end of the day or like you know risk assessment mm -hmm. uh, how cheap can they you know put up the infrastructure yeah, yeah uh, just like all kinds of things and this new this new way of building networks allows things like redundancy, which is so important. You know, mm -hmm. if somebody's hotspot goes down, there's somebody else's hotspot that can cover that up. area, mm -hmm. which a telecom would never do. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. They're like, yeah. want, want. Yeah, we'll they're send like, support eventually, yeah. maybe. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, are you kidding? Redundancy, that's so right. expensive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. When you began at Kickstarter, crowdfunding yeah. was pretty, you know, popular, yeah. widely successful, right? Yeah, yeah. And what kind of changes did you see on the platform, in the community, yeah. um, in the kind of success of crowdfunding throughout those years? Yeah, that's that's a super interesting question, actually. So um, I came in in 2016, which was the tail end of a huge investment, you know, push into IoT and consumer hardware specifically. So the years of like, 2014 to 2016 were really like gangbuster years on Kickstarter for mm -hmm. design and technology hardware devices. Um, and I came in specifically to um, harness some of that like excitement and energy in the Bay Area. So I started in the Bay Area. Um, and over the years, investment really dropped off for these types of consumer hardware projects. Like we, we saw even now, you know, Bolt is sort of like the people who worked at Bolt are now bow cunts and they're like opening up the gates to different projects and mm -hmm. things like that. That's a trend that happened over the last few years. Right. And um, and so it became a lot harder to fund on Kickstarter or to, you know, gain a lot of traction on Kickstarter because what a lot of people don't realize is that when you see a campaign, you're seeing the tip of the iceberg of all the work that went in to building right. that momentum. It, you know, if you're if you're raising a million dollars on Kickstarter, unless you have this amazing viral campaign that you really can't plan for, you have put a lot of money into ad spend, or you've spent years and years building up an incredibly engaged community. Like all of that work takes time and investment. And so there, there are definitely ways to fund an amazing project on Kickstarter without funding from VCs or investors, but it just takes a lot of time and effort. Right. So that is very hard. <laughs> something else. If you don't have money, you need more time. Exactly. Or you need more Yes, yes, that little like three-legged yeah. stool or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, honestly, there were some projects that didn't get the funding that they really needed to thrive. Like they got yeah. just enough funding for the creator to be super stressed for two years, you know? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. like, oh, they have this commitment of all these orders that they have to fulfill yeah. and not really any cushion. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times they were able to use that to get follow-on investment, which was great. Yeah. Um, but it, it was sometimes really hard to see creators take on this huge amount of work right. and commitment and go, okay, I see the yeah, next couple like years of your life. they're like indebted to these products now, yes. to getting these products out yes. the door. Yeah, which right. sometimes is like what you kind of, you need that kind of like push in order right. to get something to out into the world. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, that was a little bit, I think when we were talking about what was hard about that job, mm -hmm. That was the hardest is saying like, all right, good luck, creator. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. 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 And while you were at Kickstarter, your role shifted. Um, you went out to New York yeah. Um, yeah. at a certain point yeah. doing more of the same awesome stuff, um, but at a kind of larger scale, cover more coverage, right, yeah. in a way. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, you ended up, 
I'm like, how to put this? <laughs> I, I, I can I can maybe put it in yeah. a more positive way, I okay. think. Um, so, you know, Kickstarter, like we were talking about, is a crowdfunding platform. And another way to think about crowdfunding is collective action, right? Mm -hmm. It's a bunch of people getting together to create something in the world that couldn't be done by, you know, a single person. And that that ethos really was embedded in a lot of people who worked at the company and saw how much great work and creative projects could be put out into the world when there were many hands working on the project. And it's sort of a, a natural um, development at the company, especially at the time when sort of the idea of unions were coming into mm -hmm. the popular imagination again. Um, so many of the workers at Kickstarter were like, look, we do great work. We have all of these ideas. Sometimes the ideas don't make it up the chain. You know, sometimes great ideas were being squashed mm -hmm. by management for various reasons, you know, right. um, risk, being risk averse is part of their job, I think. Of course, yeah. But, um, but yeah, so, so, um, over the course of about a year, the employees at Kickstarter built a union together. And it was actually the first wall to wall, which means company wide tech union in the United States. It was a really big deal at the time. And now yeah. you see all kinds of tech unions popping up, which is super exciting because it's the same concept as Helium. Like we need more people involved in order to make better decisions as a group. and. Um, that was the idea that a lot of the employees at Kickstarter had in their back pocket when they were linking arms and, and joining a union. And I was incredibly fortunate to move to New York right as the union drive was ramping up so that I could, you know, be part of the process and observe. And I just learned a ton. Right. Yeah. Um, after Kickstarter, you then started a really awesome open source focused um, fellowship at NYU, right? Yes, yes. Actually, it was right before the pandemic. Okay. I, I don't know if yeah, I ever told no, you this. I do but... sort of remember that, but yeah. you were able to make, like, still do incredible work yeah. with it. And I think it also may be talking with all the different um, organizations yeah. that are part of open source. And, you know, it is just such a huge network around the world that yeah. it's like uh, probably a lot of that work would be done remotely anyways, right? Or yeah. I'd love to hear how it impacted um, the research yes. you were doing for that. Yes. So I was brought on as a fellow at NYU Law. And it was sp working with um, Michael Weinberg. You know mm -hmm. Michael from Oshawa? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, he brought me on and he was like, hey, we're going to create a big event that's going to bring all of these, you know, people across the globe that contribute to open source and are really um, core contributors to open, open source. We're going to bring them to one place and we're going to have this like conference to talk about some of the major challenges and major opportunities in open source hardware. And I was like, awesome, that sounds great. Yeah. I'd love to do that. <laughs> and, you know, we, I was sort of working on a, a sustainability event mm -hmm. for Kickstarter. So I, yeah, I love doing that work. And basically, I think a week or two after I was brought on, the pandemic hit right. and we had to sort of like figure out what else we would do to still bring um, a resource to the community to help them understand challenges and opportunities, but not in the format of an event. So instead, we created a weather report of open source hardware, talked to so many different people in the hardware space that have been proponents of open source for, you know, a decade or more mm -hmm. and um, and learned a lot, talked about sort of the big challenges when you're building a business, especially open source. Um, and yeah, put that out to the community as a little like refresher of what's new in open source hardware and how people can approach building businesses. And where can people find this awesome resource? <laughs> you know what? I'm like, I, we'll link it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll send you a link. But um, yeah, but it's uh, the NYU Engelberg Center is the center that is okay. part of NYU awesome. law. They have so many things, including the the whole podcast about the Kickstarter union mm -hmm. that I put together, which was another, like, I think Michael just heard me give a talk about it and was like, do you want to do a bigger project about the union drive? Yeah. And, um, yeah. So that was another amazing project that came out of that fellowship. Yeah. Um, you've mentioned a few times that in your different points in your career, you were sort of like the only woman in a sea of men in a lot yeah. of these spaces. Do yeah. you feel like you've seen um, a change in that over the you know the last uh 10 years of your career and moving throughout these different spaces but always kind of in the 
hardware tech ecosystem, open source hardware ecosystem? Yeah, I think that's a difficult question. I think I think in the spaces that I am the most active in, yes, I have seen a shift where people are bringing in different voices, different perspectives. Um, especially, you know, voices that are most closely aligned with myself, which is really nice to see echoed through the space. But I think hardware is still like really, I mean, tech in general is still, um, yeah, very like male dominated space. Um, so I, I don't know if it's a super yeah, you uplifting don't want to be like, answer. No, it's okay. I think it's important <laughs> to be honest about it. Like there's still a ton of work to do. Um, yeah. That and, I think yeah. we're both always kind of working on. Yes. Yes. Um, and but, I mean, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you've like, notice this i'm sure a lot of people notice but there there are more like women but not necessarily in positions of power right and that's that's the difficult sticking point Mm -hmm. yeah yeah and something that makes me a a fan or like you know really believe in trying to get more people involved in tech is that i do think you can kind of make your own path in a lot of ways, which I feel like I've heard in your career journey a little bit Mm -hmm. that you've been able to bring all these passions that you have together in your different roles. Do you have any kind of words of wisdom to make that happen for people who are interested in getting in the space? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Um, (laughs) Is that too heavy? Too much? Yeah. I mean, for me, honestly, I just feel like I got really lucky, you know? Yes, I am very enthusiastic and will put in the work, but um, but there were these amazing opportunities that just, I was in the right place at the right time. So I, I do feel like luck plays into it a lot. Yeah. But um, but other than that, like knowing people who are, who really believe in you, you know, like, like, um, like Sophie, like she really, you know, championed me getting this job mm-hmm. and um, and like Kate as well is a yeah. great person who I know you've had on the podcast is a great person who like really believes in people really like helps them reach their full potential or or at least like find a path to to mm-hmm. their full potential and like yeah so I guess like knowing the right people and then just like taking chances I think is another another yeah. thing that people don't do enough yeah um, yeah I think being open to opportunities that maybe wouldn't seem like the obvious next step always yeah. I do strongly believe that most people can do most things, especially mm-hmm. if they want really want to do it. And one thing that people don't always realize until later in their career is most of the people around you are making it up as well, right. you know? <laughs> so like, you should just like give it a try. You know, mm-hmm. the, the worst thing that could happen is you'll like learn some things along the way. <laughs> right, you know? exactly. Yeah. I'm gonna wrap it up with a few of our favorite questions that we kind of always ask everyone oh, really? on, the, yeah, oh on the podcast. <laughs> okay. So one is just what's inspiring you outside of tech and hardware at the moment? Gosh, um, yeah, my mom recently recently got me a sewing machine. That's really exciting. <laughs> I've been like, whenever you mentioned that you cropped your top the yeah. other day, I was like, I can do so many things. Yeah. So that, no, so handy yes. for quick um, alterations. <laughs> yes, yes. Like having having like a new tool is always super inspiring, I think. Yeah, um, yeah being here in Barcelona and like, I am, I, I feel like I am a broken record, but I, I am really excited about the labor movement in this country right now. I think everyone listening to this podcast should have a say in the work that they do and in their working conditions. It's like the basic thing that you need in order to do great work is Mm -hmm. to have some control over your conditions. So that's super exciting to me right now. Um, But yeah, other than that, just enjoying Barcelona. (laughs) Yes. Awesome. Cheers. I'm like, cheers to that. (laughs) And um, we ask all of our guests, uh, what is on your personal bill of materials since we are the bomb podcast? <laughs> so this can be kind of like what gets you out of bed in the morning, what gets you through your week. Some people, you know, oh, are just like I see. copy. <laughs> Some people are like, I need my Swiss Army knife in my backpack at all times, you know. So what kind of yeah. keeps you going? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I just moved to a place that is literally right above a falafel place. So Falafel you know, keeps me daily, going. Daily, daily. Oh falafel. gosh, I can relate to this. I, <laughs> yeah. Falafel's yes. so good. Yeah. Yes, but um, I think like actually, I I brought with me to Barcelona a little uh, bandana that my grandmother had actually, and I I take that with me on hikes and stuff like that. So I feel oh, like that's, that's like a core a core part of my yeah, <laughs> like it's adventure. Like a charm. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. I so I that. think that would be on my on mm-hmm. my bomb. Yeah. Have you ever tried making falafel? 
I haven't. You should I've make made them. hummus. It's so fun. I've made good yes. hummus before. But I've made hummus too. Love yeah. hummus. Yeah. <laughs> I still end up buying it. I don't know. It's so tedious sometimes to make the hummus. It oh, shouldn't gosh. be because you just throw it in a blender, but do like you to get it good. It? Do you do you take okay, the Okay, I've off? done both and I yeah. haven't found a huge difference for me. So I don't <laughs> I swear by it. I'm like, like you gotta take it off. Difference. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I did that the first time and that's what made it really tedious. But then after that I stopped doing that, but I didn't feel like it still was like I don't know, there's so many good flavors at the store too. I'm a sucker for the store bought hummus. <laughs> yeah. Well thank you so much Clarissa for taking the time today. We have a crazy agenda. I'm excited for part two of our workshop tonight. Yes, very exciting. And um yeah, it's just always great to have a conversation with you. So thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Magenta. This is great. If you like The Bomb, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and share the show wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow Supply Frame and Hackday on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube, and Design Lab at Supply Frame Design Lab on Instagram and Twitter. The Bomb is a Supply Frame podcast written, produced, and edited by Frank Driscoll and co-edited by Daniel Ferreira. Executive producers are Ryan Tillotson and Tyler Nielsen. Theme music is by Anna Hogbin with show art by Thomas Schneider. Special thanks to Giovanni Salinas, Bruce Dominguez, Thomas Woodward, Jin Kumar, Jordan Clark, Matt Gunn, the entire Supply Frame team, and you, our wonderful listeners. I'm your host, Magenta Strongheart.